Jesus is trying to tell us that he knows. Okay? That's another thing that, um, that kind of gave me not such a warm, fuzzy feeling this week, reading this book, is that we go about our daily lives, right? You know, we all have so much to do. I have so much. I am working on my old, decrepit Victorian house trying to get this room done before cold weather sets in, where I have to strip the woodwork, and I have to refinish the woodwork, and I'm going to have to install this pellet stove <coughs> in the corner, and I have to put a new ceiling in because somebody messed up the ceiling in the past. And all this work to get this room done before I went. I'm shooting for the end of October. And you get so caught up in what you're doing that a lot of things that you should be doing get thrown to the side. That intimate time that you should spend with the Lord every day, time in prayer, a lot of that stuff just is less important, isn't it? And let me tell you something, Jesus knows. The same way a man's wife knows if, if uh, he's not spending the time he should with her or he may be doing something he shouldn't be doing. The wife knows, Jesus knows it too. Jesus knows when we don't spend the time with him that we should. Jesus knows when we don't speak up for him when we should. He knows. We're not getting away with anything. When we don't do something we're supposed to do and we do something we're not supposed to do, we're not getting away with it. Jesus is there. He knows what we're doing. Most of the, most of the letters, like I said, there are some where he doesn't, condemn the church and there's one where he doesn't say anything to the good about the church okay but there is this little variance but most of the letters follow this pattern there's a description of Jesus he commends the church for something he condemns the church for something he, the exhortation where he tells the church what they need to do and a promise at the end most of the churches follow that pattern. At least if they deviate from it, they might be missing one of those or something, but it's the pattern that each letter follows. These were seven literal churches. They weren't make-believe. They weren't, you know, a secret code. I was on eBay the other day. Or eBay. Uh, YouTube. Okay. And there's this guy that he's the seventh apostle or whatever he said to the church. And, and he says that he has this video, this big elaborate video made about how uh, there's a secret cryptogram that John follows in the book. And no one, no one has understood Revelation until he's come around. And then he goes into this secret cryptogram of what you need to understand the secret meaning of the book of Revelation. And I left a comment for him that said, you know, you're nuts. <laughs> there is no secret cryptogram, and you may be a prophet, but you're a false prophet because book, the book of Revelation is understandable. So we need to understand that, these is, that Jesus is talking to seven literal, literal churches. And when you read the letters to the seven literal churches, you see modern churches in those letters. There's nothing new under the sun. We still do the stuff that the good stuff that the churches were doing and the bad stuff that the churches are doing. It's our human nature and we still do it. That's why we can learn so much from these seven letters that affects us personally because you can look at that and go, hey, that's Jackie that does that. I know Jackie does that. Hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Barb does this. And wait a minute. Oh, yeah, I do that. Okay, uh, that would be the good thing for me, the commendation. One. But uh, yeah, we will see how these things we still continue to do. Now there's an interpretation of the letters that Cliff touched on in his uh, long sermon last week called the Historical Prophetic Interpretation, where each church represents an age in the church, in the church age. Um, we're going to touch on that just to show you what it is. I don't really buy it. It's, it's a secret message type of thing in there. But there is a, you can see a correlation between the different stages of the church within the church age. And uh, it might mean something, it probably doesn't. But we'll just touch on that as we do each church. 
The word Ephesus means desire. Okay? You know how, that's another thing I really didn't pay much attention to, but each um, church, each city name actually means something. You know how like Philadelphia is a sister of brother or sister, the city of brotherly love? Well, each of uh, the names here, or Los Angeles, the city of angels, each of the Greek names of these cities actually means something, and Ephesus means desire. Now in the historical interpretation, it represents the apostolic church from 30 to 100 AD. Okay? Now Ephesus was a, uh, was a capital of the Roman province called Asia. Not Asia like we call the continent now. There was a province there called Asia, and it was, um, it was the uh, western portion of Turkey. Okay, so this was actually a capital city. Uh, John lived there before and after his exile, and church tradition tells us that he was the pastor of the church there. It's hard to think of John who walked with Jesus as a pastor, but um, tradition tells us that he was pastor there before and after his exile again. It was the site of the temple of Artemis, okay, which was one of the seven ancient wonders of the, of, uh, the world. It was uh, the Pantheon is uh, about 225 feet by 100 feet, which still exists in Greece today. And if you've seen it, it's this big majestic building with 58 columns. The Temple of Artemis was 425 feet by 225 feet and had 128 columns. So it was a massive building and was no wonder that it was one of the one, seven wonders of the ancient world. The description of Jesus is taken from Revelation 1, 13, 16, and 20 and points to the control he has over the destiny of the churches. Let's just look at that really quick. Revelation 1, uh, 13. And in the middle of the lampstands I saw one like a son of man, clothed in a robe, reaching to his feet, and girded across his chest with a golden sash. 16. In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun, shining in its strength. 20. As for the mystery of the... Oh, and that's when it explains what the seven stars and seven lampstands is. But that's the description of Jesus that he begins in the beginning of the... They use this at the beginning of the letter. The one who holds the seven stars and the walks among the seven lampstands says this. Okay? First, he condemns false teachers. Okay? And he, he says here, uh, that you put those to the test who call themselves apostles. And, uh, and you condemn them. How often do we in our church today accept false teachers? Just the, the world is, the Christian world is swimming with false teachers today. Just all over. And we want to have this attitude where we tolerate it. And it's easier to tolerate it than to speak out against it. I was on YouTube again the other day. You know, I have to say there's a wealth of information on YouTube. Some of it's just total garbage, but people have really produced great stuff and posted it on there. And there was a video of a guy standing outside of Joel Olstein's church preaching the gospel as people were leaving. And you know why? Because that guy realizes that Joel Olstein is a false teacher. 